so um, now the, the moment has come for questions. Um, I remember to to the audience that we are discussing, uh, starting from this research you got, I think, in your in your papers, among your papers, and you uh, on anyway it is it is in the in the you 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 got it. We will you will have. Uh, at the at the end of the meeting, uh, there is an abstract, a, a translation of the abstract. You can you can uh, raise question to all the panelists. I, I remember starting from uh, the two uh, people, Marinella Davide, Davide Triacca, who illustrated the research. Then Jan Werling, Aldo Ravazzi Duvon, Manfred Rosenstock. Alexander Elalawi e Alfonso Martinez Serra. Please. Does, does anybody help to to give the microphone? It's already open. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, the lovely uh, um, presentations here. My name is Mats Fritzberger. I'm a council member of the Danish UN Association. And um, it's um, more of, a, of, a, of a, an observation or a comment I have. Um, to me, there, is, uh, there are two levels here of, of the challenging, uh, challenges we are facing. As the researchers said in the beginning, um, they mentioned harmonization. The harmonization of um, the European policies that is one level. The second level is acknowledgement and um, implementation of global frameworks. Um, I come, for example, from, uh, from Denmark, and um, to align with the European level of, um, of uh, environmental uh, 2020 20 strategies, that would be political suicide if anyone would suggest that in Denmark. Um, Denmark is setting um, um, an example so much ahead, um, and uh, so, so that's a, a difficulty to um, to harmonise that inside of, of uh, Europe or the European Union. As to the contrary, we have a country like Poland, um, which are experiencing a lot of economic growth, um, but are dependent on coal and are experimenting. Uh, exper uh, experimenting with uh, fracking. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, what can we do there? The second level was about um, uh, uh, acknowledgement and, um, and implementation of global frameworks. We have a situation with I increased uh, in, um, inequality globally, and uh, um, there are demands outside of Europe that um, they want the welfare level that the Western world has had uh, um, so far. And um, when, when, for example, Singapore is experiencing drought, who are speaking in that part of the world about uh, climate change? For them, it, 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 it's not uh, necessarily on the table. And they have this demand that they want to experience um, the welfare and uh, all those kinds of possibilities. So how do we act not being imperialist or colonial uh, in our thinking towards f uh, finding a common ground? As uh, our la um, um, uh, most recent speaker from Bilbao showed, this is about not political will, but political courage and to cooperate and collaborate uh, um, in, in specific terms um, both with civil society and with the, with the private sector. Um, but I'm, I must stress, political courage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Rosenstock maybe can give his opinion about that. Yeah, it's working. Uh, maybe I can start uh, with, with two thoughts. On the one hand, um, the, the EU harmonization versus the global challenge, and you said for Denmark, um, EU harmonization is not much of an achievement. 
The, the idea is on the one hand, we, we set things by legislation, standards and norms, but on the other hand, we also exchange the best practices among member states. And if a country like Denmark, which for example, in terms of the use of environmental taxes, is a leader within the European Union, can present and sell, in quotation marks, its, um, its successes there and demonstrate how things can be designed to work and to make us progress in that direction, then I think the European Union is a good forum <coughs> to advance this process because we, we might not be able to legislate on everything where we could theoretically legislate because member states will not follow us on that road. But who would refuse to, to go down the road of an exchange of best practice? And then um, on, the, on the point that uh, the developing countries will want to grow, definitely true. Um, but um, they would not, we would not, and hopefully they would not want to grow in the same old ways that we have grown and do the same mistakes. So on the one hand, if we progress with breakthroughs in technologies, these can be taken over by other countries. And if you look at what China has done in its massive growth over the last years, they have seen the problem and they have legislated and introduced steps, for example, on clean air standards and especially fuel efficiency standards. And where did they look for ideas? Here in the European Union. So I think First of all, you can lead by example, and second of all, you can lead by technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, more questions? Uh, Jan can, would like to add something. I, I would like also to add one thing, because I, I won't make any, any conclusion later on. Maybe if me, we may have some hope at the international level, it may come from China, not in the sense of a Chinese contribution to reduce the emissions, because anyway, it's growing and may, maybe the trend could be diminishing, but not the total amount of Chinese emissions. While in the local, lo local field, because uh, as you can see uh, today, you, you, ha you have a huge problem uh, of uh, pollution in the Chinese cities, you can see in, in the, on, on the web the Beijing uh, dramatic situation where sometimes the local authority ask uh, people not, not to go to primary school each three days in order to avoid uh, ingestion of pollutant that could be very dangerous. And to give a, a brave example, the, the Chinese president went walking in the street a few weeks ago, just showing that they have the will to share the problem with their community. I, I mean, the uh, Chinese contribution to the global pollution could come maybe through a, a local pressure in order to improve the quality of air and the quality of life of people. I think it's in, in, in this, in this uh, uh, very, very strong uh, trend of industrial and economic growth. Uh, Jan. So, consequently, I have two things to say after what said uh, Francesco. Um, about harmonization, if I can understand what you said, could be a limit to harmonization, European harmonization, <coughs> harmonization in uh, energy politics. I, s I have two examples in my head. Who is, uh, uh, says that we need uh, not really an harmonization, but a common policy in Europe. The first one is what was said in the report, is the necessity to have a, a common grid. Uh, because with a common grid, you can, uh, as you said in the report, uh, have a price for electricity very uh, uh, a bet in a better way than today. 
And the second way is something we did but by the past with uh, planes. We build uh, uh, industries, European industries, Airbus, uh, and we need to make such uh, cooperation between industries on this new challenge of renewable energy, energy efficiency. I think we, we could build a, a sort of, of a consortium like Airbus on, on energy. And uh, because if you, we, we don't make that at an European level, we, can't, uh, we, we won't be able to uh, be in a, in a good uh, competitiveness with countries who are like continent, China, Brazil, United States, uh, France alone, Italy alone, Germany alone are not able to have such industries. So cooperation in Europe to make this poly energy policy has these goals. Second uh, remark I wanted to, to make after what you said about air pollution and what you develop on your uh, uh, example in Bilbao, um, um, I'm a politic, so I'm uh, like every year in elections <laughs> and uh, local elections. And the uh, theme of air pollution is a very central uh, question. And what was I was thinking listening to you that is that uh, I think it's about 80% of the population are in the cities today, living in urban urban uh, areas. Uh, we have cities, big cities, a big responsibility to build solution uh, on such uh, problems like air pollution. And uh, I think that uh, in cooperation between uh, uh, big cities in Europe, you we can build solution, technical solutions, political solutions, industrial solutions to fight against air pollution and perhaps create a new competitiveness, green competitiveness in finding solution and working together all the big cities perhaps with Europe to find this solution is a thing uh, like benchmarking. I think we have to, 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 to go in this direction. Thank you very much, merci Yann. One question. My name is Brice uh, Arnaudo, pardon my French, and thank you for letting me speak. I wanted to go back on the, the idea of uh, European Union leading the, the change to green growth. Uh, first, some people uh, are talking about uh, giving um, uh, for free the technology to developing countries concerning uh, re reviewable energy. So what do you think about this? Could uh, Europe be uh, the first step to to give for free technology to countries like uh, in Africa or in, uh, in Asia to have a, a more clean, uh, a cleanest growth. And uh, second, uh, in all presentation, we, we, we heard that uh, it's uh, an urge to change our way of life. Uh, so uh, what are the, the perspective, the political perspective to, to help people change their, their mentality? I mean, Europe is uh, the city where there is the most people using bike and trying to recycling and, and so on. So uh, what are the initiatives to, to develop that even more and maybe to, to share it to, to the... Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we got two questions. The, are there any other questions? So, so the, the, the last one, so we can give to all the panelists the opportunity to give their answer. Thanks. I'm uh, Luca, study European Studies. Um, I had a question regarding the uh, common grid. Um, for me, it sounds a little bit like a one-size-fits-all approach, and I was wondering if that's not a little bit too dangerous, considering that in the European Union you have 28 different states with different uh, conditions. And also, I was wondering how would it actually work when you set up such a grid? I mean, who's involved? Is it, you know, privately funded? Is it, do you have more public actors? I'm, I don't really uh, comprehend exactly how it's supposed to work. 
Thank you. Starting from Alfonso, uh, the answers and the opinion after this round table. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to say something about uh, cities. Um, uh, generally speaking, when you look at cities in the world, there are two classes of cities. Those that are already made and those that are in the process of being made. Um, in particular in Europe, North America or Japan, cities are already built. I mean, you look around, everything is in place. But you go to Latin America, Africa, Asia, and cities are being made before your eyes. Okay? Now, there's a problem here that I call a blank page problem. And many of you here can understand this very well because you are very, very young. Okay? So you have blank pages where to write your future. But the moment you make a decision, you are compromising your future. What I'm trying to say is that in a city that is already made, you have to play along the rules already existing. You can't just take down everything to create a new, fresh city the way you want it to be. But if you go to China, Latin America, you see cities that are being made as we speak. Now my question is, why are they or we constructing cities that are old before they are born? And I'll just give you an example. Transportation. I don't know if you agree or not, but let me be very, very clear about this. The future of transportation in the cities is without a private car. No cars will be allowed in, down, in, in cities, downtowns, in the near future. Now, you go to places like China that you mentioned before, Mr. President, and they are building car cities for cars all the time. 20 years ago, there were more bicycles than cars in Chinese cities. Today, you only see cars. Now, my question is, why are you making mistakes investing a lot of money and knowing very well that you are not making the right decision? If you look at our own cities, and by our own cities, I mean Europe right now, we realize that we are not exactly building the city of the future. We are rather building the city of the past, but we pretend that it's going to be better. It is not. It's going to be worse. So we have to make some very, very realistic decisions about the future of the cities in Europe. Some cities, or rather some parts of the cities, have no solution. There's no way to improve what goes on in those cities. But for the places that can be recreated, we have to make it happen now. No matter opposition or, I mean, it's a question of leadership. <clears throat> I could give you a lot of examples. Not only cars, but what about basic supplies like water, <clears throat> energy, uh, and many other things. It can be done in a very different way. Only if we recognize that we have to start now instead of waiting until everything goes wrong and they pretend that we can have a new solution. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I gave an answer to any of your questions, but I really wanted to say this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alfonso. Uh, here there is a youth attendance, and we are discussing about future, about the energy, about sustainability, about jobs and growth. Maybe in this panel, uh, there are the two. You, you, you will have the floor to, 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 for a conclusion, Davide and Marinella. Uh, but uh, maybe the youngest is Alexander, so you have a big responsibility to answer to people with your age. 
I try. Um, whoa, that sounds funny. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to add two points, and um, they first relate the first questions raised. Uh, I think it was one that you said, um, what are we going to do with the developing countries? I fully agree. Uh, they need growth, and we want to support them. But the question is then how? And I have a telling example. Um, one, one of the biggest state-owned banks in Germany, the KfW, does development policy, does provide finance to developing countries through financing um, different projects to giving credit, to giving loans. But when you look at what they finance abroad, for instance, in Greece, in Serbia, India, South Africa, it's coal companies. And I simply don't get that point. You could equally finance other, you know, more uh, renewable energy production uh, companies and, 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 and um, um, generators. So why, why do you have to go into these coal plants again? So I think there you can make a difference by both allowing them, allowing them to grow, which we absolutely want, but linking it with climate goals. And I think this also relates to the question um, the French colleague raised with uh, giving away free technology. I mean, OK. I mean, I have no problem with that. But then again, you could also do it with the loan system, as I described it yet. It's, it's a form of development policy. We use it. But the way then is you know, how to structure it and how to use it. Um, Regarding the common grid, I mean, I'm not a technician or an engineer. We have these people working in our organization as well, and what they told me is this. It's absolutely feasible. You can do it. Uh, the technique is there. And actually, we need it because there was one situation in Germany, I think it was last year in summer or a couple of years ago, where we had actually an oversupply of uh, uh, solar energy, and our systems couldn't handle it. So what did we do? We had to export it. We had to force it into the other systems. I think it was Netherlands back then. There was another example where we had an oversupply of electricity in our systems, and we had to push it into the systems of Poland and Czech. They didn't want it, though. And it, you know, it evolved as a whole diplomatic crisis, actually. I mean, this is, this is I think, a catchy example that stresses the need to develop these common or European grids. And um, I, I don't even think it's a matter of finance. I mean, to build the, the, the network in Germany for enabling this energy transition, I think the number is estimated at 30 billion. This is frankly nothing. Uh, I mean, institutional investors sitting on trillions. So I think in the end, as you put it, political will, political courage, whatever you frame it, I think this is really the key, the key question here. Just like. Alexander Aldo Ravazzi Duvon. I think I have two points on which I, I can contribute. This is yours. Well, anyway, you can. Yes, thank you. Um, the first is the question of harmonization, which was raised by Mats earlier. Uh, certainly, we have a problem of finding common rules at European level when we can. In the case of, for, of green fiscal reform, we have a major problem because the unanimity rule is required for fiscal measures. Uh, at the same time, while we try to transform the constitution and to try to, to win against uh, uh, national egoisms from this point of view, I'm talking of UK, of Poland, uh, but even Italy and other countries have their own national interests to defend from time to time on these issues. We have a number of instruments which are available for policy making. And one is uh, enhanced cooperation. You remember these instruments were a third of European Union countries can stay together, at least one third of countries, and do things together in the European uh, Union framework. And on this we can work on green tax reforms. And the other one is outside but uh, uh, converging with European Union spirit. Is a, it is what Frank Convery calls the co coalition of the willing. I mean, if a number of countries are available to introduce a carbon tax, they can cooperate. And if they don't find the European Union framework to cooperate, they can do that outside. Uh, my second point is on the problem of development, the right of developing countries to development to reach a, a level of quantitative consumption. And this is certainly uh, legitimate. Uh, on one side, we have a moral duty to, uh, to show the example. And we are doing many good things from this point of view. The ETS attempt is a fantastic uh, attempt, even if it should work much better and much more efficiently. 
uh, we are doing a lot of things on biodiversity, on climate change, on all the different crises. We have a, a very strong economic financial crisis since uh, 2008, but we have several environmental, climatic, biodiversity, soil use crises, which has started even before 2008, and we cannot forget them because of the economic financial crisis. Probably in our countries, we have achieved a level of satisfaction of needs and of demand in quantitative terms. We have a major problem of distribution. If a crisis hits the 5 or 10 percent poorest people, if the GDP reduces by 10 percent in five years, that's a rough estimate, and it hits the poorest in the population, we have a major social problems. But it's not difficult on distributional ground to find solution to cope with that and to compensate, to reorganize a little bit things on, from this point of view. Whereas the developing countries need a minimum threshold and they need also a quantitative uh, uh, development and we must help them. The transfer of technologies is a very difficult challenge. Technologies are in the hands of companies. Companies, it's their duty to find their way through profit maximization, through efficiency. There is a need there probably of public intervention through ODA, through cooperation mechanisms to help them to avoid the same mistakes that we have done in developing countries, in developed countries. And certainly in each of developing countries, there is a big debate as we have in our countries. I know lots of Chinese who are asking for better market-oriented, developing, sustainable uh, policies, respecting the limits <coughs> of the planets. It's not easy. There are a lot of people. Huh? It's difficult to find an agreement among us for 500 million Europeans. It's not easy among 12 or 14 hundred millions of Chinese. But in each country there is a, a big fight and we have to support those who are helping to find out the, the best solutions for a, a sustainable green growth. Very, very good. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I think it's very, what was uh, the most inter interesting fact uh, is uh, your attention. Because it was uh, sophisticated uh, in, in uh, strategic, economic, uh, technical aspects, debate. Mm. Uh, but I think you, you can appreciate the fact that everybody was moved, even in an in a official position, uh, by an ethical motivation. Everybody. Because we think that we are discussing about something that has got a big problem to, to, to face. We are discussing now. What's happening now is decisive for the future. But nobody is able to take, nearly nobody, to take a decision today, paying the price today, to prepare a better future. So what we need today is to try to forge this sophistication of analysis and proposals in uh, answers. So I would, I would like to give the floor to the two researchers because they learned much, I think. They list, listened to, to many important opinions. Uh, just to tell us how would they like through our institute foundation and also Thanks to the ICD hosting, dear Mark, all of us today in Berlin. How do you think, uh, Marinella and uh, David, uh, to develop this research, this analysis, this analysis that is uh, very likely to impact on the European decisions uh, in the next weeks and months? Uh, I would give the floor to, to Marinella also because she's the only woman in our, um, in our panel that is um, quite awful, sorry. <laughs> I will let her speak for us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I, first of all, I, will, I want to thank you, all of you, for the attention, for the inputs that uh, came from the from the floor and um, yeah concerning the research i think that our message is quite clear we are asking for a more ambitious 
Europe for a, for a more uh, ambitious action that uh, will be able to benefit uh, from the green growth uh, opportunities. And um, uh, so in this sense, we, uh, we will hope that the European, in, European is still now is in um, is deciding what's the future concerning the ETS process. Several reforms are um, on the tables on the table, and also concerning the the target. So uh, I hope that our our message will be uh, integrated in the will be in some part in in some sense uh, uh, integrated in the in the answer that you and. Um, I don't know, I would like to thank you for uh, everything and I will give the floor to David. I just very briefly want to conclude uh, saying that w the main message I th that in my view comes out from uh, all the discussion we had is, is that um, our future is not, is not a matter of technology, it's not a matter of Techniques is not even a matter of money. It's just a matter of will. Europe needs to decide uh, what to expect from its future, what we expect from our future. Uh, and I think that, uh, I'm sorry if, if I will be a bit utopistic, but uh, I think that uh, Europe should be, again, the protagonist of its, of its fate, of its future. Thank you. So thank you very much. Grazie. Arrivederci.